I, I think any exposure helps you. You know, you get exposure, and um, we've had some exciting games and stuff. And so, yeah, you do get uh, more recruits kind of alert, more recruits uh, talking to you. Uh, you know, occasionally somebody that blew you off says, hey, buddy, remember me? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, it does. You do get a little bit of uh, uh, traffic and interest on it. Part of it is, I think, they like to see the action. Just what were your overall thoughts on the win at Oregon and what stood out to you when you looked at the tape? Uh, well, I thought it was a very hard play game. I thought we played extremely hard. I thought, um, you know, just kind of, you know, there was an adjustment to that game too, uh, at least by us. I think probably by Oregon as well. Um, you know, where basically everybody goes out there and it's a bunch of intense speed stuff like that, a little bit out of control. And then um, I thought that we got on in control first on defense. And then I thought, uh, uh, because even after our that first touchdown, the first defensive stuff, we were still kind of all over the place, I thought. Uh, we settled in first on defense, uh, which you typically do. Uh, offensively, I thought the, the more consistent uh, Luke got, the more consistent we got, and I thought that built as the as the game went on. And so, uh, but then it was still kind of an explosive game because uh, you know we're playing extremely hard, and there are fast guys running around all over the place. So, how quickly did you know uh, Powell was going to take that fifty-yard field goal? It didn't seem like the second guess gave you away. Well, I knew he'd have enough leg. I mean, I just figured, you know, he, and he, of course, he drilled it down the middle. I mean, I knew he, because he can kick like, uh, I mean, I know it sounds ambitious to some, but he can kick a lot further than that. You know, I mean, it's, uh, he's got to hit that sucker, too. But, uh, no, he, he launches it. He launches it. That's a tough, the, the other thing is, that's a tough stadium to kick in. It's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's uh, both ends closed up, dead air, whatever, heavy air. just a stable presence at Holder and, and Trey compared to last year where there was kind of a couple people in and out at, at, at Holder. Do you think that's helped with, with Eric this year? I think so. I think it probably has. Um, the Because uh, they get used to it the same way. The other thing is, is um, you know, uh, I've done it, I mean, I've done it all ways and it, it, and it works. The best combination of all time. Mm. The very best is if you can uh, train the punter to hold. Because then the kicker and the punter can build up their drills. And, you know, and they do little drills, and they're great drills. I mean, they hold balls and they drop it in such a way that, you know, then they'll pop it, try to hit goalposts, and then they'll, you know, kick it across the field. And you might kick a field goal if it was way over here like that. That'd be a melee question. It's over. It's over fifty-three yards for sure. I mean, um, uh, I, you know, and it's like it's a little hard to gauge. But just consider how far he um, kicks it in our stadium on kickoff. Some uh, shortness, uh, shortness pass. So that's going to cost him a little. I mean, it's still pretty remarkably deep if you think about it. Maybe one of these times we'll get him to do an extra. Um, I mean, I 
seeing in my root form, I'm a huge Eric Powell fan. Uh, we're not meetings very much. We don't cross over a lot on the field, you know, other than, you know, uh, a good job after he makes it. Because, um, you know, uh, Eric Maley handles the special teams. And then, uh, so, and that, that's the one thing that uh, I think is challenging as a, as a kicker or a punter, is you're kind of uh, a little isolated doing your own thing because you're, you're with the team. When you're, uh, you know, in the off season, all those activities, but understandably, you're working on a different skill than they are. So, you know, they're not really in offensive drills, they're not really in defensive drills much, you know. Um, and um, so, you don't see them as much, you know, as you'd like. And, you know, you'll remember uh, we had one kid, he, uh, I think he still has an all time record. say about this defense and where does this defense rank with some of the units you've been a part of in the past throughout your coaching year or coaching career? I, I think we're still getting better. I think we're still getting better. I think we're emerging. I think we're a work in progress. I think um, uh, you know, if we have a chance to be good, we're still a relatively young unit. So, um, you know, we've got plenty of space to grow. Are you impressed by the fact that Grinch has been able to plug players in with, you know, you guys have suffered a, a couple injuries in, in recent weeks, but it doesn't seem like you guys lose a, lose a beat when someone else is coming in. No, it's always part of it. You know, you bring as many guys you can and teach them their role, and then it's always part of it. Just uh, uh, the next guy up and keep firing away. Coach, Dylan talks about him and Frank Young almost competing for sacks on the field, but playing together. Uh, what has Alex Grinch's role been in forging this identity on defense and creating the spirit of camaraderie almost? Mm, I thought we had that before pretty well until we discovered worse. I think, you know, he does a good job leading the defensive unit and we keep things competitive. And then Robert talked about um, the secondary being more disruptive in Cal Grinch. Uh, six games into the year, have you noticed the that you have played with more of an edge than in years past? Uh, maybe, but it also helps that we're um, affecting the passer uh, at a higher rate more quickly. I think it both goes hand in hand, the D line and the secondary ball. Uh, this secondary is probably the best work rep wise, uh, being in the fall camp and doing some practice with the air raid offense and some groups, Stasher at quarterback. How, how, how much has that helped the secondary just before the season starts to get some different reps? I think that's helped a lot. I think they go against the, the really good receivers. They go against the <coughs> good passers. They do it all summer. They do it all spring. They do it all camp. And I think that all adds up and contributes. What are your thoughts on Cal overall as, as you look at the film? Good team. You know, we're explosive. They're an explosive team. Uh, you know, a little like us from the standpoint they're fighting to be consistent. Um, and, uh, you know, they always get good players, so, um, uh, but they, I think they are a good team. I do think they, uh, um, and they're, they're explosive. I mean, every tape, uh, and we've watched a number of tapes of Cal's offense, and they always have a lot of explosives on them, so. Um, and then uh, defensively, they play well on defense. They're hard to throw against. They run to the run to the ball. And the other thing is, I think we're getting better too. When Bo Baldwin was at Eastern Washington, did you guys ever meet at different points 
during your tenure or his tenure, and just what are your thoughts on Bo Baldwin as a, as a coach overall? I always liked him. I always liked uh, Bo Baldwin. We used to see each other uh, once in a while in Spokane, you know, there'd be uh, just sort of activities or gatherings or, you know, just see him at uh, some coaching deal. I always liked Bo Baldwin a lot. Uh, Coach Fish, um, so on this type of eerie feeling, um, leaving Boston Stadium and, and going to the airport, that it just seemed like everyone was already on to the next win. Was, can, can you talk about, did you feel that at all in, in the bus on, on the way there and playing home? No, nah, we try to push that. I, uh, I, I can't, uh, I don't know if I felt it on the uh, leaving the stadium. I was a little preoccupied with a bunch of stuff, but... Um, uh, I definitely felt it last night. You know, I felt like it was that way last night, uh, well before we went out on the field. So questions on the line for Coach Leach. All right, lost interest. Okay, well, good to see you guys. Any <laughs> questions back in the room? Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of talk. Right. With, uh, one sec, Steph. Um, Coach, there's been a lot of talk about kickoff times, and I know Chris Peterson had a lot of comments on that. Did you happen to hear anything that he had to say about that subject? I didn't hear anything he had to say. So essentially, he was just talking about how Washington has played all night games, and he thinks it, it stinks for their program that they continually play at 5 o'clock or later, and if they don't get the exposure they need on the East Coast. Uh, what are your feelings about how the, the TV schedule is structured? Why, 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 did, why did he care? Why, why did he care? Because they're picking off ten forty-five on the East Coast, and he's just saying no one really gets to see their games that day. Well, well the East Coast stays up late. I mean, you know, um, heck, I've been to the East Coast. Bars don't close on the East Coast till four a.m., and that's because they're planning to stay up late. You know, um, so uh, oh, they'll probably stay up late. I don't. Yeah, I, you know, I don't care. I mean, I, I honestly don't care. But playing um, about what time they want. I mean, sometimes if, if they get too out of hand, um, you know, with the hours, like you know, like you know, these games at ten a.m. are ridiculous. Anybody wants to play at ten a.m. is out of their mind. Anyone that wants to play after eight is out of their mind. Um, but um, you know, if you, and I, if you just think about it, because we always played at night. Uh, before we were on TV, much we always played at night. Seven thirty, I think it always was. And once TV got involved, they said, "Well, you're going to be on TV. We want you to play at seven thirty. And then, um, so we were on TV. Uh, you know, and we played at seven thirty because uh, some people in Lubbock thought it was too hot, which I didn't agree with. Best time to have a game is around uh, between two and four. That's the best time. Uh, you guys are a top ten team at this point. I mean, you have a quarterback who's starting to get some Heisman attention. Do you not care about that exposure, or you know, do you care? The East Coast isn't seen. You know what we've seen. Well, if you have a pretty good product, I mean, you know, if somebody's going to be a Heisman voter, they got a little bit of responsibility to do their homework. Otherwise, they shouldn't be allowed to vote. You know. Um, so if they fancy themselves as a football enthusiast, and a whole lot of people do that uh, don't know the first thing about it, but um, but if they do in fact fancy themselves as a as a football expert, it's probably uh, uh, their obligation to uh, make it their business to see these kids, you know. And uh, and nowadays I, I would be stunned if you can't find most of it on the internet or the back channels on the you know the eight hundred cable stunned if you can't find it. And then um, the, uh, um, well, and I'm always up that late anyway, so what, I mean, I, I, I don't even relate to the question very much. I mean, um, so 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if, if, if they're going to vote on any of this, they're, they're, they're required to sit up and watch it and have some expertise on it. And then, you know, you go, you go from there. But, uh, you know, I mean, Eisman's supposed to go to a guy that's uh, been most instrumental to his team. And so, you know, if that was the case, Luke would have won it last year. But, you know, these guys don't vote on it that way. So, so overall, just – do you believe there's any sort of East Coast bias in the sense of the college football landscape with all the different timetables and how usually the best Pac-12 teams play at the latest window? Uh, I don't know. You know, everything's lying about that all the time. You know, East Coast bias uh, is there. I don't know. There might be. Um, you know, but, uh, I don't think. You know, I don't think there's any more East Coast bias than I do. There's Los Angeles bias compared to, uh, uh, to up here, mm -hmm. which there clearly is. You know. um, I think it's related to media things. You know, you got a lot of newspapers, you got a lot of viewers, you got a lot of reporters there on the East Coast, and they, you know, and um, you know the people around them, if they're beat writers for and stuff like that, that uh, they're familiar with, or um, you know, and or the forefront of their mind, are going to get the most. I think that's part of it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they uh, uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles teams always get more attention than any other teams in the conference, regardless of uh, how they play. And uh, so, I, and there's just a lot of uh, noses in the newspaper, a lot of people watching the TVs, and you know, and there's a big base down there that they're trying to. Um, Give them some attention. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's East Coast, uh, West Coast, any of that as much as you're in a big media base. I think there's, you know, there's uh, just more coverage. And, uh, you know, there's more coverage, and there's, uh, you know, if you're in a big media base, uh, you're going to get more coverage. But uh, I think you can solve nearly all these questions if they have an expanded playoff system, which uh, uh, I started talking about when I was an assistant. At and, uh, you know, if you had, uh, I think, 64 teams, but I think the minimum is 16. If you had 16 teams, then I think we could settle a lot of these issues. You know, it doesn't matter what the East Coast or Los Angeles or anybody in between think. All of a sudden, there's 16 teams. Oh, gee, number 16 beat number four. Well, screw number four. Number four is out. You see, because number 16 got it, you know. I mean, that'd pretty well solve all of it, wouldn't it? And then 32, you could easily beat 32. And then, um, uh, and then the, the, you know, the most stunning thing, and I give this lecture probably three times every year, but um, then college football says they scratch their head and they give a really befuddled, mixed up look, and they get a really screwy expression on their face. Like, well, how can that possibly be? I mean, how can we do that? I mean, how is it possible that you could actually have a playoff format in college football? Well, gee, I don't know. Let's start with, uh, we, we can go down to the local city park, and I'll bet you somebody that handles youth football can tell you how to do something like that. Well, that's too low of a scale. Let's move it up a little bit. Okay, how about high school from a major state? Let's say Texas, Florida, or California. Let's see how they do it. Boom, they're in the playoffs. But they don't have just two or four teams or something. Hell no, because they want everybody to have fun and enjoy this playoff system. So they have 16 or 32 or 64 or something like that. Okay, so then they play each other, and everybody's on the edge of their seat going to wait and see if this team's going to beat that team or going to beat the other team. And so then, uh, in the end, there's occasionally a debate. If only this team hadn't lost to that team this round, and this team could have won the whole thing, and that's perhaps true, but the thing that is indisputable is that at the end of the gauntlet, this team came out on uh, number one, and there's no debate whatsoever it's who's state champion. Then you can go to Division three. Let's see how they do. Oh, they do it the exact same way. Okay, now the suspense is really starting to get thick, because, you know, Division two might be a little bit. No, in fact, they don't. They just
do it exactly, exactly, boys and girls, like the vision of Greenville. And then now they've changed the initials, because in this era of political correctness, they love to change initials, make it proper to say things one way instead of another. And I forget what the initials are. But then they go to one double A. Okay, one double A. How did they do it? One double A. One double A. I mean, because that's getting closer to us, and we're really sophisticated, because we're major, major one A. How did they do it in one double A? You know what? They have a playoff board, man. And they play it, and they figure it out. And, and, and then, um, okay, okay, okay. Well, that's, they're all below us. Okay, what about above us? The NFL. And everybody, you know, that just makes you feel good to roll those admissions off your, uh, your It's like Huckleberry Finn said, some days I just have to swear to get a good taste in my mouth. Okay, so then NFL. Now that makes my mouth feel good because that's the best in every time. Let's see here. How did they figure out their championship? <clears throat> well, they in fact organized a playoff system. And how many teams are in there? A hell of a lot more than four. And then they sort it all out. And then <clears throat> they, <clears throat> they have one battle after the next. And at the end, guess what? They sort out a champion. And it's called the Super Bowl. And there's not interest diminished because people are captivated by the playoffs. And the biggest sporting event every year in the history of the world is the Super Bowl. Okay, any questions? How many regular season games would you play with a 16-team playoff? It's like Division Three. I think they play 10 games rather than 12 or 13 like you play in. Well, um, okay, so in, in major college, uh, or in major... Um, Big high school stakes usually a champion plays 16. So I think your target point is 16. So you shoot for 16. And then uh, that's what a Division II ends up to. A Division III, uh, maybe it's 15. One double A usually it's 16. Maybe high school it's 16. NFL is more than that. So I think our target's 16. And you could easily, you know, uh, start it out. And then, then the other thing that I think college foolishly does is they just give the NFL the center. I mean, there's no sense in that. I mean, you could be at a playoff game there in December, and everybody could potentially live happily ever after. And then the other thing is you could even sort the schedule in such a way that you have an off week one week, half of America has an off week one week, the other half has an off week the next week, and you never have to play somebody after the off week. If you wanted to go 64, which I think would be doable, <coughs> 10 regular season games. Ten regular season games. Okay, you play your three games. Okay, then, but everybody's guaranteed 12 for their budget, and this would be besides the reason. Everybody's guaranteed 12. Play your ten regular season games. Okay, and then uh, get to 64. Okay, so so you're playing, and, and then halfway in between the ten regular season games, like say around the, uh, five and six, half the country's off. Towards the end of the season, some teams know they're not going to make the 64. So you have a week off to, um, to uh, select the 64. So on that week off, a couple teams that know they're not making the 64, they schedule, you know, uh, uh, to, for one of their 12 games, they schedule it. And so it's like, uh, you know, somebody say on the West Coast, play somebody way over on the East Coast so we can sort out all this East Coast. I mean, maybe that team could get to the bottom of it. And we would all be enriched by what they discover. Okay, so then, um, so then after they get done doing that, um, then you've sorted the 64, and several teams have done uh, one of their 12 games or additional games are allowed. Okay, then you have the, the first of the 64, you go home and home with somebody locally, you know, kind of within your reach. So, I mean, just depending how the season goes or whatever. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's Oregon versus Utah State. You know, for the first. So you do a home and home. Whoever's got the best record, the, the, the team with the worst record has to come to your place. You play home and home. Okay, so then, then after that, you get the bowls involved. But 
you're at the bowls for a shorter period of time because you're just basically getting there to the bowl, doing it, but the bowls know how to put on big games. And then, and then the bowls, uh, the number works out almost perfectly for uh, the additional game, um, the additional playoff game. Okay, so then, um, uh, then after that you get the bowls involved and then it's other locations. And I do think there should be some more northern as uh, we sort this out. Okay, so then, <coughs> about halfway through that playoff system, you could have another break. Okay, and then the teams that haven't finished out their 12 games, they could play during uh, that period of time. And I get a kick out of it, it's just comical. They say, well, nobody would watch those games. Oh, baloney. I mean, my wife would watch them. I'd go home and, and, and you know, after a hard day's work and there's something on on Thursday and uh, you want to know where the sandwich stuff is and the grocery stuff is, well, you can't because she's watching the game. There's a game on Thursday. I mean, somebody in the max playing and, oh, my gosh, are they going to score? Are they going to stop them? I don't know. But I know this. I'm not, <clears throat> you know, I'm not going to be able to sort out where all the groceries are anytime soon on that, you know, because uh, I don't go in the kitchen that much, so I'm just pulling cupboard doors open. And so that... Um, um, they, yeah, they watch, and they watch a lot, and then <clears throat> and you could make the matchups real interesting and everything else. Okay, so then back to the then you get back to the playoffs, and so you go. You could get it all done uh, by uh, January first or sooner, depending on how you did it. And you can even just map out the weeks, and it works out pretty easy. And then. Um, uh, the other thing is, is uh, uh, heck yeah, people watch, and if there's something riding on the king, there's all of a sudden people just like they do in basketball, they'd select teams and dark horses or favorites that they wanted, they'd have little, uh, you know, they'd, 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 they'd have little sheets with, uh, you know, office pools and everything else, and, uh, you know, they would, uh, uh, they'd either laugh and taunt their friends or the other way around because their team did well and um, yeah, it'd be fantastic and there's there's no disputing that it would make a lot more money it's just who gets the money and I think that's the biggest rub on the whole thing Let's go to questions on the phone line Go ahead, Steph Hi, Mike How are you doing? Um, get off, good, good To get off the, the playoff thing a little bit and more on your team, I guess you know, what has, do you think last year season and the way that unfolded with the two losses at the start and the three at the end. Do you think that has taught your team anything about managing success and being even healed throughout a season? Uh, you know, I don't know. I thought that uh, as we went on last year, we got better and better competition. And then, you know, we had an awful lot of young guys out there that have never had an off season. I'm sure it helped, though. I'm, I'm sure it, it's contributed some. But I, I also thought we had a lot, a lot of the freshmen we were playing, I thought ran out of gas the later we got in the season, which that's always a concern no matter what. Okay. And also, the way your kicking game has improved with Powell being very reliable this year and the way the defense has improved, has that changed the way you call a game? Because I looked at your fourth down conversion stats and you've been going for it, I think, less, like more than half said. Uh, fewer, fewer times than you had last year up to this point. Yeah, I'll tell you the biggest thing is um, a couple things. One is uh, uh, Powell's gotten more reliable at kick and field goals. Um, and then the other thing is that Phil has done a good job of uh, dropping punts inside the 10. And, uh, you know, teams always talk about that a lot. And uh, most teams can't do it. And I've been on team after team where you talk to the special teams guys and, you know, the guy can do it about, you know, one out of six times in practice and all of a sudden in the middle of the game he's going to do it. And they just get the ball on the 20, you know. Um, so, but this guy actually can. And uh, so that's contributed to it as well. Which the other thing is, is I'm not sure that uh, my approach Interesting. So it's, it's sort of 
of an experiment for you? I guess as we were, you know, getting a sense of what these guys could do, and the thing is, is so far Powell's held up kicking field goals, and <clears throat> and punters held up uh, dropping it inside the ten. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on the phone line for Coach? Okay, back in the room. Do you feel like your team thrives off heading on the road? It seems like all of them love hearing the booze, and not that they don't like playing at home, but it just seems like a big experience for them. It seems like it. It does. I um, And I've wondered about that. Because <coughs> um, we've been a pretty good road team. Um, and, you know, and then uh, there was a stat, and you guys probably know this. Um, our conference had a winning record on the road last year, didn't they? In other words, the road team usually won. It's, I mean, isn't that how it unfolded, which is a strange thing, because it certainly isn't that way in the Big 12 and the SEC. Um, but um, I think, actually, the road teams uh, had a winning record over the visiting teams in this conference last year. I'm not sure it had gone on for a little while. That would be interesting because I've certainly had <clears throat> that sense, and I don't, I don't know what it is because the environments are still hostile. People still scream and yell, and then, <clears throat> um, you know, and so it's, you know, it's like prank phone calls that they don't have anymore now that you can tell who else calling you. But back in the day, I mean, if somebody had a good prank phone call, you'd want to, you know, if they had a good material or. Yeah, I mean, you tell them, like, yeah, that's a good job, you know, and be some kid on the end laughing or whatever, but, um, you know, that's kind of how the opposing stadiums are, but, you know, if they have good information and it's clever, I mean, then you say, well, that's just clever, but, you know, and then I think when it's Easter, you do it at the, uh, you know, conference, and then you swear at them, so you suck, and then they repeat it over and over, and it's like you're jumping, but you're, you know, you're, you're the one Not memorable. Uh, don't care what you think, you know. So I mean, uh, the redundant stuff. But, uh, but the um, some of them are quite creative, you know, and those are good, you know. Um, and every stadium's got their thing, you know. Uh, but yeah, it, it does seem like the road teams fare well in this conference. Seems like the players, you know, satisfaction or quieting in a opposing stadium as a head coach. Do you, do you get the same satisfaction? Yeah, that, although it seems like I always find it late, you know, because, uh, you know, you're out there trying to, you know, get a first down, 12 plays, all that. And, um, you know, you may hear after the fact that something happened, this or that happened, that, you know, stuff got quiet. And, you know, and then, you know, I didn't know until late in the fourth quarter. So, so yeah, I. Coach, what's your initial reaction to Gary Anderson's departure from Oregon State? Uh, I like Gary. I mean, Gary, Gary's, uh, Gary's a friend of mine. I like Gary. Um, uh, I don't know. I uh, haven't, you know, haven't heard, uh, you know, his whole side of things, you know. But I, I thought he's doing a good job. And, I mean, and last year I thought we were the toughest conference in the country. It may still be this year because, you know, there's uh, – in our conference, from top to bottom, everybody can get you, so there's no breathers. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know, but uh, but I like Gary and uh, wish him the best. Yeah, just a phenomenon. Would you say, in your just from experience in the past, is it harder to get here or harder to stay on TV? I don't know. You just do one at a time. You just constantly improve. You know, constantly get better and better. Enjoy out there practicing and battling away because you're going to do it a lot and that's uh, the whole process and that's what everybody signed up for, you know. Is there anything noticeable with teams that have been able to stay consistent like the Indian stand out to you, teams that have been able to, you know, keep playing? I think they, they I mean, over time you get a tradition where it's like expected, you know, your older guys expect it, some of the young guys come up that way and then they expect it of the young guys and maybe some old guys and I think that, um, that whole um, kind of legacy that's created with uh, the one state.
different time, you know, with people and that they have success and, and reinforces the whole thing. So I think it's a, it's a battle. Uh, you know, I just think it's a good way to do a playoff. And then as I looked at it, I think we could easily fit it in. I mean, it requires cutting the regular season to 10 games, and then the winner would play 16. You know, the, the champions would play 16, and then some would play 12, and then others would play, depending how far they ascended in the, the playoff format. Um, you know, I honestly know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I watch it, and I kind of observe it, and, sort of, uh, uh, well, my two, uh, 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 you know, Gonzaga here that are nearby, I read it for, but I also like South, uh, South Carolina because I know Frank Martin and, you know, and I love the way he demands he gets the most out of his guys. And then, um, <coughs> but uh, I, I don't watch it. <coughs> Uh, well, that, and that's tough because the thing is, is um, uh, all all his stuff have a certain sound to them, and they're all good. Uh, uh, oh, what do I think I just like better? Well, the, this later stuff last year, Dance uh, for Mary Jane, uh, but the early stuff it was. Uh, Refugee and uh, what is it? Running like the wind or running something? <coughs> That's old for us anyway. You gotta sing it. I can't. <laughs> I, my, my wife would be able to sing, but I can't. Have you ever seen him live? No. No, I haven't. Um, but he was respected enough that uh, all the old guys all wanted to play with him. You know, even Bob Jones had guys and all those guys. That's good. Thank you, Goldsmith. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.